Something really, really cool happened in the Valorant community last week. The Valorant slash Riot devs actually played against some big name streamers and former competitive, former pros in the Counter-Strike scene. They played against Summit, Shroud, Skadoodle, Dizzy, and Flum out of the loaded GG talent agency, and they destroyed them. They played three maps and it was 3-0. Every single map they won and in massive fashion. And it's really not often that we see devs that are good at their game. I can't name a single one in Fortnite. I haven't seen anybody. In Counter-Strike, I haven't seen anybody. In Valorant, we actually have some former pros, former CS pros out of Volcano and former FPS pros all around. This is a real breath of fresh air for a competitive game, one that's meant to be in esports where they can balance based on actual knowledge of how the game plays competitively. Not only was it good content, but it was able to teach us a lot about how the game can be played competitively, about how to set up, you know, executes, how to set up little tactics, how to set up the synergies between the abilities that these guys know in and out. They must have played the game in scrim level at a competitive level against each other so they figured that out and because of it it taught us a lot if you watch these games you probably learned a thing or two i saw a couple clips going around on twitter we're going to look at those things but we're going to look at much more and before we get into that i want to thank golden boy and rivington for casting this but also want to thank golden boy specifically for letting me use all these clips that i have today so thank you so much and also want to remind you guys to please like and subscribe as it does help regardless let's hop into what i learned from the riot devs Map 1 was Bind, and a lot of people saw the clips of Raze's pink shell through the teleporter to Hookah, but what they didn't notice was the synergy between Cypher, played by NTT, and Raze, played by Volcano. Notice how Cypher had a tripwire in a cyber cage directly on Hookah that he triggers as soon as the wire is broken, and also calls for Volcano to hit them with the nades. Wow, the double nade from the Volcano, that is crazy! In this next clip, we'll show a similar synergy. But first and foremost, what I want you to keep an eye on as I show you even freeze time is how Cypher is setting up B and then rotating off to A. NTT teaches me that as Cypher, you have to stay unpredictable as to which site to set up. And the long freeze time where you can roam freely among the sites allows this, as compared to CS where you're stuck in spawn. He applied this on every map as well, so Cypher players be aware. But getting back to the raise synergy, watch how Cypher is constantly checking the camera to spot Hookah for Volcano. Is gonna make him pay with that shot over by B Fountain. Still though. That's the nade he threw. So it did go through the teleporter. Yep. I, yo, I didn't even know that. This, as well as most likely good communication between NTT and Volcano, is why the paint shells work so dang well within the first three rounds here. So if you want to apply this to your game, think about applying a spotting method first. They don't even know. They're genuinely perplexed. They're, how are we dying? Here's another clip of NTT switching things up on bind and using his tripwires and cages on A. And like we saw in the pistol round, he sets up a cage with the tripwire so that he can insta catch people in the cage and block an important line of sight. But also note the camera placement. This is actually quite a difficult camera to see from the opposing side since it's stuck down low on top of this roof. Full vision of short. He used variations of the setup and played the U-Haul corner to insta-peak with tripwire cage activation often. Switching agents now and looking at a wonderful Sova dart and another portal interaction that picked up a little buzz on Twitter. This one lands directly outside the showers teleporter on the floor to reveal everybody in a pretty wide area even a bit towards short A as well. Not only is this a useful informational play if you already have a plan to get the info you need at B, but the devs went a step further and paired this with the Phoenix Salt, which a lot of people probably didn't realize can teleport. So Nick Wu shoots the arrow, scouts and distracts for Xcal, who ults through TP for a nice set piece combination with the push from A showers at the same time. This is how you play aggressively as the defense in Valorant, and it's beautiful. Now on the offense, a pretty dope example of how to use abilities to entry with Nick Wu's recon bolt again, but this time through a smoke for Xcal to entry with the Sheriff. A lot of scouting goes into these first two kills, but most importantly, the wall hack dart giving the vision for Xcal to take the shots through the smoke to find the room to win the round. But also I want you guys to note how even with the entries, they take the site with sound fundamentals, one on each side of the crate and one over top. And anybody playing back site has no chance as it's an easy forced 1v3. And you're gonna hit those spams. The chance that the bullet can hit from this sheriff is huge. For those of you wondering how to properly use Cypher on the attacking side, look no further as NTT's role every single round for the devs was as a lurker. He was always setting up his camera and at least one trap wire as a fly catcher for those pesky aggressive players. The team was taking one side, he was on the back side covering the flank. 
and also taking massive flanks himself. Interestingly enough, this small rotation from him to cover short A and the teleporter from Hookah completely denies any room for the defense to retake the B site since he knows nobody can come through TP or push around on the flank with his setup. Orb control was a massive part of their defaults on the attacking side. So here's a quick and easy way to use Jet paired with Sova to take long C orb that they used on pistol round. In every map, they challenged Orb on both sides quite aggressively, since they clearly knew how to use their alts to a massive advantage. Here's a nice little, not too complicated garage tick that is really easy to pull off by Niku Sova, starting with the recon dart through the top of the double doors from safety, and then combining with the owl drone to follow up, allowing them to walk through double doors completely risk-free. They try to work double doors into garage at least a little bit every single round, and for good reason, giving access to both C and a flank onto B. This little bit of map control is incredibly important throughout all stages of a round. Speaking of Cypher's role on the attack, here's a nice little round that shows off the importance of the flank control and power of a Cypher Lurk. His camera controls any push from A, which gives him the confidence he needs to hold mid and A by himself against an aggressive eco round by the defense. I also want to mention his non-lurking role that will be a bit more relevant later, but he set up a slew of traps and cameras pointed at A in combination with always using a cyber cage to help his teammate cross into short A without getting harassed by an aggressive long A player. Once they back up and take long C, Cypher becomes the flank holder. A solid beginning anti-eco approach. You can set up a teammate to peek a corner with your owl drone like so, making it distract opponents and probably catch them off guard, messing up their aim as you swing shortly after it peaks. And then also, a nice little spam spot the penguin shows off into garage. Most brimstone players are probably wondering how to actually get kills with their ultimate, and I think the main thing that the devs showed us over the three maps was that they don't actually use it as a killing ability, but rather as space control to choke players out of specific spots or cut an entire area slash rotation off for a brief moment while they make their approach. Here's that in action on the sea site of Haven. Other side, orbital strike deployed by the Brimstone. Cage triggered. All right, before this clip rolls in its entirety, don't hate me for geeking out on super simple stuff. This is a 1v2 situation with plenty of time on the clock, but I love how Nick Wu goes for this. Even though it doesn't work, he knows where the available bodies are for Sage, but he also knows has an ult ready. You can always see your opponent's ultimate statuses by looking at the top bar and seeing the yellow highlight. And because of that knowledge, as soon as he sees the resurrection, he instantly uses his Hunter's Fury to try to get them both down, as while the interaction from the res is happening, they are stunned slightly, and it almost works, but just wasn't quite fast enough. So you know how I mentioned how Cypher set up his teammate Volcano to cross over A safely? Well, while that was well and useful, it was all leading up to a plan to eventually run through the cage while the player along A feels comfortable grabbing the orb because of the conditioning the Cypher has done. Look how free this kill is down long A for the devs. All because NTT uses Cyber Cage every round before this. If you're not familiar with tactical FPSs, conditioning your opponent might be a foreign concept, but we constantly see top teams do things like this to stay unexpected and keep people on their toes. The Riot devs have been changing things up. It's actually been super intelligent. Here's a quick little Sova retake dart, but in addition to learning a new dart setup, check out how it's timed right when his teammate's pushing out of the spawn. So not only will it reveal when it's necessary, but also distract as they peek. Here's the lineup for the spam spot that Nick Wu drills Flom through on the double doors. Another Nick Wu clip, and I love how passive he plays this, and actually gives up the B site so that he can go for more important control of garage and middle. But before he does that, this first entry was well played, and notice how quickly afterwards he leaves as fast as he can so that he cannot get traded, and the perfect timing for his recon bolt to come up as he bounces that off the wall into garage and slowly retakes it while not fully trusting the information of the dart. Slowly, he begins the flank and chips away at the space the attackers have just given up. From mid, he gets the one, and then again repositions to make it impossible for him to be tracked while his teammates work the front lines. I also learned in this round, thanks to the commentary from Rivington, that defuses grant ult orbs. So finally, for UCS players out there, there's an actual reason to TK the person defusing for the MVP star or extra score. Actually, thank goodness there's no friendly fire for the most part in this game. Get a little social distancing in there as Penguin takes out Sky and he goes for the bomb defuse. They're gonna go ahead and transfer. Okay, so we spoke about conditioning as a method that teams use to catch people off guard, and we talked about orb control. Let's watch a few early A ramps control takes that the devs do on splits against the streamers since they manage to do something different here every single time. 
and it always involves actually peeking and engaging the fight on A ramps. The what appears to be unconventional Jet and Phoenix combo works wonders. The first take is fairly simple, a flash around the corner, then a wall to grab the orb. No engagement. The second does go in Trial's favor and Exile goes down, but the hot hands to cover the one aggressive defensive angle is meant to keep Shroud pinned away from taking the peek, or forced to get even more aggressive into them. The third one is just a ridiculously cool jet peek that I first show from Shroud's POV because of how sudden it looks, and then we can watch it from Excal's perspective as well, and see that he combined his passive to glide down from a normal jump and land slightly faster and farther than expected by Shroud, going over his crosshair entirely to get the wall bang headshot. This round is actually a continuation of a round where Shroud got that first pick we saw from before, but I want to point out is how quickly Sage goes over to secure that res and return the round to a 5v4 so early on, and also how many ults they commit to the round to secure it. After the res, they waffle a bit on which site to commit to, but settle on A, and Brimstone, while he's lurking in middle, is able to contribute from range with his ultimate like we talked about earlier, to contain the towers while the A site is stormed by the rest of the team. Three down just like that. It's getting late here, so we're gonna finish things off with this crazy simple and easy, but hard to find entry attempt by Nick Wu, who uses his recon bolt to get information on towers as the round starts, and then follows it up if he spots someone with the Hunter's Fury ultimate. Ultimately, he doesn't find anything, but man, is there potential for this play at different stages of the round. So, our first glimpse of competitive Valorant comes at the hands of the devs themselves. But as I make this video a week after that happens, I've already seen a couple of tournaments where passionate and very good players are already implementing these techniques and innovating to come up with a lot of new ones. So all I can say after watching a few of these is that the future of competitive Valorant looks very, very bright. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.